I'm Matt Butcher. Uh, I'm one of the Helm Core maintainers. I'm super excited because we have a bunch of Helm Core maintainers on here today. Uh, Karen, Bridget, Martin, and I will all be talking a little bit. And then during the workshop portion, you'll get to meet some other Helm Core maintainers. So here's the, here's the agenda. All the time zones here are on Pacific time, uh, which I am not. So I apologize if I mis make any mistakes here. Uh, so we'll, we'll kick off now, do this brief uh, welcome deck. Uh, then I'm going to dive in and talk for about an hour about um, about Helm, what's in Helm 3, how Helm 3 changed. I'll give you some history. I'll tell you some hopefully amusing stories uh, and give you kind of the conceptual grounding for the next talk. Uh, after I'm done, uh, Martin, one of the core maintainers and and the person who is instrumental in handling the in building the Helm 2 to 3 migration plugin, will dive in with a really practical talk about uh, how that works and how you do migrations with Helm. Uh, and, and we'll uh, walk through kind of the, the entire process start to finish. And then we'll take a short break after that. And then uh, the part I'm really excited about is we'll do a hands-on workshop. We've been working to prepare some curriculum to basically make it easy to walk through uh, the process of doing a Helm 2 to 3 migration. And we've got a whole bunch of, uh, of people standing by to help out. Uh, we'll break into some breakout rooms and we'll uh, we'll do that all together. Really looking forward to that. So that's our that's our agenda for the day. Awesome. Okay, so next, um, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, everyone should be muted upon entry. Um, since this is a regular Zoom meeting, um, we want to give our speakers the time and um, attention to present first. And so with that, if you do have questions, um, please go ahead and drop them into chat. I and um, I'll be going through them and we'll we'll do them at the end of the presentation. So again, just drop your questions into chat and we'll do them at the end. And then please make sure you adhere to the CNCF code of conduct. This is an official CNCF event, so um, just be respectful to everyone here. And then um, lastly, just kind of a huge thank you to all the people who've helped put on this workshop. Um, so you know the people listed are helping with the hands-off workshop or doing the presentations or have just contributed to the event in some way. And also a huge thank you to CNCF for um, their support with our events. Cool. Um, with that, uh, I guess, Matt, do you want to get started a little bit early? Sure. Okay. Uh, well, um, I'd like to introduce Matt Butcher, uh, Principal and Software Engineer at Microsoft, and he will be talking about what is in Helm 3. Okay, uh, slides up okay, Karen? All right, okay, so uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I, what we're gonna, what we're really get focusing on today is uh, the differences between Helm 2 and Helm 3 and how to migrate from one to the other. So in my session, I'm gonna talk a lot about how Helm works and, and kind of what the design decisions were. I'm gonna talk about what some of our mistakes were in earlier versions of Helm, how we tried to fix those in Helm 3, uh, and, and really try and lay the foundations for what Mark, Martin is going to talk about. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about, very focused on sort of the, the way that things work and the abstract notions that we have uh, guiding Helm. Then I'm going to hand off to Martin, and Martin is going to take a much more practical approach and really focus on what it means to upgrade uh, what, uh, how, how things work, what to, what to look out for. So that's how we'll break things out uh, in these first couple of sessions today. So the first thing I want to talk about is November 13th, 2020. For us, November 13th, 2020 is a very important date. So I would encourage you to keep in mind the date November 13th, 2020. I'll just keep repeating that date over and over. What happens on November 13th, 2020? Well, that's just a little bit. That's about a year after Helm 3 came out. And this happens to be the day that Helm 2 becomes unmaintained. So what does that mean? Well, there are two major th components of this that you should understand. Um, the first one is that the piece of software that we call Helm and Tiller will no longer receive any updates at that point, right? So currently we are, uh, we are in the RC phase of Helm 2.17.0, uh, which means it'll be released within, within a few days. This is our last Helm release on the 2.0 two, uh, 2 branch, our last planned release. So for a long time, we've been doing only security fixes on this on, on Helm 2. 
Uh, but uh, all good things have to come to an end. And in this case, uh, in order to, to devote full attention to Helm 3 and start the planning for Helm 4, uh, we need to uh, stop supporting Helm 2. So 2.17.0 will be the last release. There will be no additional work on Helm 2 after that. There will be no updates after November 13th, 2020, not even security updates. So that's one, one part. The second one, which has been, uh, which, which surprises people a little bit more, is that on November 13th, the stable and incubator chart repositories will also stop receiving updates. Right now, they're in maintenance only mode. If you go look at github.com slash helm slash charts, you'll see that people are still making fixes to things, but they're small fixes, right? And we're not accepting new charts, I believe. Um, but the plan is that those repositories will no longer receive any updates. And uh, from November 13th onward, uh, they will be marked as archived and, and uh, no, more, uh, no more security updates, no more uh, new charts being added. Um, furthermore, uh, as of November 13th, 2020, the Google uh, cloud storage bucket that holds a bunch of those charts will no longer be available. So we're working on migrating everything over to charts.helm.sh, which will be the new uh, endpoint for your Helm repositories. But those will just be mere or static archives of the, uh, the, the Helm incubator and stable repositories. So very quickly then, what does that mean as far as how you get charts now? Here's kind of the... Here's kind of the deal. Um, when we first started this model for Helm 2, uh, you know, back in 2015, 2016, um, we, we never expected Helm to, to grow as quickly and as expansively as it has. And so the process we had for, uh, for accepting charts was very editorially based, where we had a group of people who, uh, who managed the stable and incubator chart repositories and uh, examined every single chart that came up. Well, it has become an unmaintainable situation. There are just too many good charts out there and too, um, and it's too stressful to try and be the sole gatekeeper for the public Helm chart world. So over the last year, and you probably noticed this, we have been starting to spin off separate chart repositories and we've been switching to a model closer to NPM or CPAN or any of those sort of distributed package manager systems. So now we have Artifact Hub, which is an official CNCF project. If you are looking for charts, you can go to Artifact Hub, uh, search for something in there, and it will point you toward, it'll give you instructions on which repository to configure and which charts to, to fetch from there. And so behind the scenes, Artifact Hub is sort of aggregating from dozens and dozens or probably hundreds at this point of package archives uh, for Helm charts. And, and surfacing those in a nice, easy to use search fashion. In Helm 3, we actually have the Helm search client wired up to talk to Artifact Hub. So if you do Helm search hub WordPress, it goes to Artifact Hub, finds all the WordPress charts on Artifact Hub and, and prints them out in your command line terminal. So there's a lot of integration between these two, but going forward, stable and incubator as centralized chart repositories will be gone and this more distributed approach where people, uh, organizations and individuals self-publish their charts, that's the way we'll do things going forward. So November 13th is a big deal because we're making, all of those changes will finally hit their very last phase on November 13th. Um, in, in these last couple of weeks before then, you can still expect security updates and very, very minor changes on the charts repository. But if you don't upgrade by November 13th, 2020, uh, you will be on your own because the Helm maintainers will officially uh, uh, stop all of our development efforts. So that's something to keep in mind. And that's actually the real sort of driving force for why we wanted to do this webinar right now so that you would still have ample time to uh, finish up these migrations and so that we could help you, you know, sort of proactively prepare for this and find uh, any, any potential gotchas right now up front when core maintainers can be here and, and help you. Okay, so that's kind of the preamble, all right? So what I'm gonna cover in this particular talk is I'm gonna start by giving you sort of the background story for where Helm came from, how it developed along the, the particular path that it did, uh, and, and, and point out some of the hiccups along the way, one of our really bad assumptions that we made that, that we had to correct for with Helm 3. Uh, after that, I'm going to talk particularly about the the uh, the brief life and tragic death of Tiller and uh, and what that means in the context of Helm 2 and Helm 3. And then I'm going to spend some time talking about releases. So 
Uh, this might sound like a, a technical detail, but it's actually the most important concept to understand when we're doing these migrations. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up uh, by talking about the differences between charts in Helm 2 and in and, and Helm 3, and then I'm going to pass it on to Martin, who's going to take that practical approach and actually walk through stuff with us. So uh, where did Helm come from? Uh, uh, maybe the story has been told too many times, but I'm going to tell it again anyway, because it's Helm's birthday and it's fun uh, for me to tell this story. Um, five years ago, uh, we had a, I was, I was working for a company called Deus. It had just recently been purchased by Engine Yard. And we had been doing some R&D on this brand new platform that was called Kubernetes. Now, I think at the time, Kubernetes was maybe at version 1.1, 1 .1, uh, maybe 1.2 by that point. Uh, and so we had been doing all kinds of crazy stuff, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, experiments and, and uh, you know, edge leaning things, trying to figure out, uh, what we could do with Kubernetes. And we had become convinced that Kubernetes was going to be the next big thing. So we decided to have during our, our company all hands meeting, everybody flew into Boulder, Colorado, and we decided to announce there that we were going to pivot a lot of our development efforts to Kubernetes. So uh, uh, I, I was asked to present a Kubernetes in a nutshell kind of thing uh, to explain to not just the other developers that were in my group or in the Deus part of engineering, but to all of Engine Yard, including marketing and communications and the executive team and everything, explain in 30 minutes what Kubernetes was. Now, I'm sure some of you are, are laughing already because we all know how hard it is to explain to anybody what Kubernetes is and what it does. Uh, so, uh, so, and I drew the after lunch slot too. So I knew I was going to be doing this right after lunch. So it came back uh, and, and, uh, uh, arranged my kids' stuffed animals around the house and took pictures of them and a uh, giraffe and a gopher and stuff like that and, and wrote this silly uh, presentation, silly um, uh, PowerPoint presentation called The Illustrated Children's Guide to Kubernetes. And uh, Karen and I later partnered up and, and, and did the little book based on that. So later that day, we decided to kick off a hackathon project. At stake was a $75 Amazon gift card. And so my team, uh, Jack, Francis, and Remus, and I, uh, Jack, Remus, and I, uh, we decided that we wanted to try something Kubernetes-oriented because we had just kind of announced that was going to be our big shift. So we, uh, we came up with this idea to do a package manager for Kubernetes. We called it Kate's Place, K8S. Uh, we thought it was really cute. And, uh, and we spent the next two days, you know, at every, every possible moment between sessions and late at night and stuff like that, hacking together this little demo of a package manager for Kubernetes. Uh, so we won the $75 gift card. I know that's what all of you really, yeah, we, we won it. We split it three ways. I think I spent mine on food, um, <laughs> unsurprised, probably coffee knowing me. Um, and, and then we thought that was the end of it. Well, the next day, which was a Friday, I got into the office and uh, the phone rang. Yes, actual, actual phone rang. And I, I picked it up and it was the CEO and the CTO. And they said, hey, we were talking last night and we think that this, package manager for Kubernetes thing might be a good idea. So we'd like you and, and Remus and Jack to keep going on that. We'll, we'll give you a couple more engineers and we'll see if, we, see if it goes anywhere. And I went, oh, great. That sounds great. That'd be a lot of fun. They said, just one thing. We'd kind of like you to change the name. We're not, we think Kate's Place might not be the right, you know, the right name for it. So Jack and I sat down with a nautical dictionary and flipped through it, uh, uh, tossing words back and forth until, uh, until, until Jack said, hey, wait, how about Helm? And, and I went, oh, that's great. And then we came up with charts as the metaphor for what the packages would look like. And that was the birth of Helm. So, uh, so Adam Reese and Michelle Norali and I really spent the next several weeks just hammering away on code. It was, uh, you know, Go, and that was a new language for, for some of us. And, and we were just kind of working and working. Uh, really exciting. Uh, various engineers would drop in and help out and then drop out. And on the very first KubeCon, uh, which was in San Francisco, we announced Helm, uh, which was, I think, Helm 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 or something like that. And, and we showed it off. Now, the first KubeCon was probably smaller than this, uh, than this uh, workshop today. I don't remember how many people it were, but I remember being able to make eye contact with pretty much everybody in the audience. Uh, so it was pretty small. And we had a great time, and it was a lot of fun, but we didn't really expect it to go anywhere. So that was about, I think, November, maybe early December of 2015. Well, uh, January, Google called us and said, hey, 
you want to fly out to Google in, in Seattle and chat with us about Helm. We've been working on this other project. We think the two can collaborate. So Adam and I and, uh, and Gabe fly, fly out to uh, Google in Seattle, meet with some engineers there, and they propose that we merge together Helm and they're, uh, they're about to be released, or maybe it would, had already been released, system called Kubernetes Deployment Manager. So we started working on that with them. Uh, that became Helm 2, the basis for Helm 2. So Helm 1 never really saw the light of day. Uh, I think the Helm Classic, which is what we call it now, maybe made it up to 0 0.13. But because Google had already released what they called their 1.0 release of Deployment Manager, we had to skip to the next number. And that's why uh, we went from Helm Classic to Helm 2, but never really released the Helm 1. So we worked together on that and then released uh, the new version of Helm. And we were shocked when people just started jumping in and contributing code. I think we have now hundreds of companies and thousands of developers who have contributed code to Helm and uh, probably an order of magnitude higher than that who have contributed charts and developed charts and stuff like that. It's just been phenomenal. Uh, it's been uh, fabulous. But as we went, we realized that some of the assumptions we made back in the Kubernetes 1.2 to 1.3 or 4 uh, times were incorrect assumptions. And what we really wanted to do is we really wanted to follow semantic versioning. And semantic versioning says, you know, um, uh, version numbers are major dot minor dot patch. So if you fix a bug, you increment the patch release. If you add a feature that doesn't break anything, you increment the minor release. But anytime you need to make a breaking change, you have to increment the major release number. So we knew that as soon as we broke something, we'd have to go to Helm 3. So we deferred for a really long time and collected all of our breaking changes up and then started this big development effort to do Helm 3. And then when we released Helm 3, we knew it had a lot of big changes that were gonna necessitate things like today's workshop, right? Um, but, and, and then with Helm 3, you know, again, we're, we're following the same pattern. We're not gonna introduce any breaking changes during the lifespan of Helm 3. Helm 4 will be the first release where we break anything. Uh, but what this meant for us practically during this sort of history of Helm thing is that we, we did have to kind of buffer up a lot of changes and wait for quite a while. And then, uh, you know, Adam who ran the, uh, the Helm 3 development cycle said, okay, here we go, everybody get ready. And we started doing patch after patch after patch, breaking change after breaking change in the Helm 3 branch, and then eventually got that stable and got that released. So that's kind of the story of how we got from point A to point B. You'll hear me mention here and there Helm 4. Helm 4 is really just an idea at this point. There's no ongoing development for Helm 4. Um, so so don't, you know, don't worry that you're going to migrate to Helm 3 tomorrow and then have to migrate to Helm 4. It's still probably a year to two years out. Um, but we are trying to open up the opportunity now for the developers who have been currently maintaining Helm 2 and Helm 3 to be able to work on Helm 3 and start buffering stuff up for that Helm 4 bucket. All right, so that should give you a good background of, uh, of uh, where we've been with Helm and, and what it's done. But I want to pivot now and talk for a little while about Tiller. Uh, and I, so I, I like to call this section the life and death of Tiller and overly dramatic telling of the story. <laughs> um, so it all starts in that January meeting at Google. Uh, so we were at the Google campus having a great time. Um, we took a break uh, at lunchtime, went to the cafeteria, all together, we're standing in line, you know, in the in the uh, the the you know scoop food on your plate section of the Google cafeteria, and just kind of chatting. And I'm chatting with one of the engineers there, and he says, you know, I really like working on Kubernetes. This has been great, but I'm a little concerned because uh, you know some people seem to think that you know we're going to be talking about thousand node Kubernetes clusters with lots of different development teams working together, but you know, look at Kubernetes. We're we're not going to be able to reach that. Uh, he said, you know, Kubernetes is never going to be a multi-tenant system. It's always going to be the case that a development team stands up their own Kubernetes cluster. We have three, maybe five tops, maybe 15 nodes on this thing. And, and you know, each team has their own. Uh, and, and, you know, so that became the topic of lunch. And so we discussed this thing, the whole, the whole of lunch, I think. Uh, you know, how much can you stretch Kubernetes? Was it foolish to try and do thousand node clusters with no role-based access control and, and no real strong notion of authentication? How are we going to do any of this stuff anyway? Um, and kind of at the end of the lunch, we had kind of basically convinced ourselves that yes, indeed, Kubernetes was going to be a single tenant system and small teams would work on it and every team would have their own cluster. And that actually became 
sort of a, maybe, maybe from that point on unspoken, but sort of a driving principle for how we developed Helm from then on out. Now, keep in mind, at that point, there really weren't any RBAC uh, mechanisms in Kubernetes and admission controllers were not a thing. Uh, deployments weren't even a thing at that point. CRDs were not a thing at that point. So to some, to some extent, any kind, anytime you jump in early, you make some guesses. In this case, we were not, we were not minimally wrong. We were not kind of wrong. We were actually really, really wrong, right? Uh, I routinely see clusters with hundreds or thousands of nodes and with dozens of development teams or even hundreds of different teams with hundreds of different applications running inside of a single cluster. And it works and it works really well. And it's turned out to be one of Kubernetes's strengths. But keep in mind this little assumption we made that might not have been right as I start to walk through the architecture that we're gonna talk about. Because that one, <coughs> that one uh, flawed judgment, I think, changed the architecture that we did and is what ultimately caused the biggest change from Helm 2 to Helm 3 as we corrected for that. So this is how Helm Classic worked. Helm Classic, basically was a manifest uploader, if we were really honest. I mean, package manager is a very generous way to say what, what Helm Classic did. Um, it, for the most part, had a chart.yaml and a bunch of static YAML files that were just Kubernetes resources, and it could bundle them up together, send them all to the Kubernetes API server at the same time, wait for the API server to say, okay, you're good, and then uh, report to the user that it, was, that it was working. That was about all Helm Classic did. Uh, we relied heavily on conventions for labels and things like that for people to be able to figure out what they just installed. Uh, and we didn't really have a strong upgrade story or a, or a strong rollback story or even a team management story for Helm Classic. Uh, but again, it was 0 0.13. So, uh, you know, it was fairly early on. One of the things that a lot of people have not taken a look at is, uh, is what deployment manager did and how, so we were taking that model, that Helm Classic model and combining it with the deployment manager model. And that's where Helm 2 came from. <clears throat> the deployment manager model, and I'm, I gotta be honest, I don't actually remember the model and all the names correctly. So I've kind of fudged some of the names here. I think the client was named KDM. Uh, and I, I, I can't remember what we called packages in deployment manager. They might've been resource bundles or templates or something like that, but I just left chart here for the sake of continuity. Um, but essentially the way it worked was the client was, would upload a package to a server that was running inside of a Kubernetes cluster. And that server was called deployment manager. It was a JSON API server. Uh, we'd send data up to it. We'd send, you know, a, a chart, we'll keep calling it a chart. And deployment manager would unpack this chart and it would send the templates over a network connection to another service running inside of the cluster that was called Expandybird. Now Expandybird was sort of like a multiple template renderer. It had, it could render Python uh, code. It could render um, uh, uh, some template languages. One of the, one of the Python template languages, I forget which one it was. Uh, it could, it had experimental support for JSON it. Uh, but it was basically like it, its job was to expand templates and then return back YAML. And then DM would store the YAML in MongoDB and then upload a copy of the YAML manifest to Kubernetes, wait for them to come back successful and then return to the client that it had deployed. So this should look a little bit familiar because uh, parts of this, you know, made their way into Helm. Um, side note here. On occasion, people ask us uh, to include support for more template languages in Helm. And the main reason we, did, we don't, and we've reconsidered this multiple times, but we still kind of stand fast on this one, is because our experience with Expandybird uh, indicated that it would get very, very complicated because what we were experiencing was a single render, right? A single chart uh, might pull in you know, some, some Python code, some, you know, fairly trivial templates and some JSON it. And then it would render something and it'd stick it in the cluster. And you'd go and look at the cluster and go, well, where did this thing come from? And then you'd have to sort through a combination of Python code and uh, templates, curly braces, templates and JSON it and try and figure out how they interacted together in such a way that they produced that thing. And then, you know, we were talking about adding more languages. We were talking about adding Go templates and other languages. And we realized that this was going to be such a, a mess that it would be, it, that a sizable chart could be practically impossible to debug. So one of the early decisions we made 
was that we, we did not think it was right by the user or the chart developer for us to support multiple template languages. <coughs> Even though that meant that some people would have to learn a new template language, it prevented the case where all people would have to learn nine or 10 different languages in order to just read a chart or look at their install and know what happened. But uh, so we took this deployment manager model and that earlier Helm Classic model and we sort of combined them and we decided to reduce the complexity in deployment manager and increase the complexity from Helm Classic and kind of meet in the middle. So what was the DM server got replaced with what was Tiller, where Tiller's job was to sit as a gRPC server. The Helm uh, client remained relatively straightforward. It would basically take charts and values and upload them to Tiller. Tiller would then render the templates itself uh, perform any additional operations, load that stuff into the Kubernetes API server, store a release record of that release inside of Kubernetes, and then return back to the user and say, okay, I, I deployed your thing. Uh, and this worked well because it introduced for us over Helm Classic, the ability to do upgrades and then rollbacks, but it was still simpler than the deployment manager model, <coughs> which, uh, which was definitely on the, on the complex side and difficult to operate. So this seemed to work well. And it met many of our obligations because we had one single tiller that was almost like a root user. And, and since we were working for, you know, single tenancy clusters, it was a great solution for us. And we really liked that. Uh, but over time we realized, and I'll talk about this, you know, coming up soon, that tiller was not holding up to expectations. In fact, where we had assumed Kubernetes would go one direction, Kubernetes really turned a very different direction. And because of that, we had to adjust course. And uh, we, again, waited for a while, but when we did finally do this with Helm 3, what we decided was we needed to remove Tiller. The Tiller was actually, had become more of a hindrance than a help. So really in effect, we rolled back almost all the way to the Helm Classic model. Uh, but we, there's one notable change. And this is the change that we will spend the, the, uh, a, a good chunk of our time today talking about. And that is that we kept the notion of storing releases inside of Kubernetes. We just took Tiller out of the equation and Tiller was no longer the sole authority of those releases. Uh, but, but we kept the, the object, the release objects there. We had to tune them up and that's what causes this whole migration thing is that we made some changes to the release object. Uh, so we'll talk about that in just a moment. But before going there, I wanted to talk about why we removed Tiller. Uh, there have been uh, speculations, there are a lot of loud opinions and stuff like that, but uh, in all honesty, it boils down to one thing. Uh, it boiled down to authentication and authorization. Uh, so people will say, oh, well, you know, Tiller was a security nightmare or Tiller was a stability nightmare or I had to run nine of these things in every cluster or 64 of these in every cluster. And those are the superficial problems. But the core cause of all of this was actually we hit a boundary with authentication and authorization and we could not figure out a way to solve it. <coughs> Excuse me. So what was, what was the boundary? Well, here's how it goes. Um, in Helm 2, uh, I'm, I'm, use, I'm, you know, I'm Matt, right? My username's Matt B. Martin is Martin H, right? So we're both working together on a cluster, hypothetically. And, uh, and I log in to Kubernetes using kubectl, right? What does it do? It authenticates me against the Kubernetes API and then grants me permissions based on what Kubernetes knows about my roles on the cluster. Now with Tiller, I could use those credentials to tell Kubernetes that I was allowed to proxy through the Kubernetes API server into Tiller. But once I got to Tiller, uh, I could do whatever Tiller could do, right? Uh, so if Tiller had cluster-wide access to do anything, then I could upload a chart and say, hey, put this, install this WordPress thing into dev, which I have permissions to. But if Tiller had permissions to install into Martin's staging environment, then I could say, hey, put this in Martin's staging environment and Tiller could do that, even though I personally would not have had permissions to log in directly to Martin's staging environment. Um, that's not necessarily a, it's not a bad feature if you're working on a small team of users and, and the trust model is that everybody on the team is trusted. But as soon as you get into multi-tenancy situations, that's a bad security model to have, right? Uh, and so we tried to fix it. And what we wanted to do was to say, okay, 
I want to tell Tiller, hey, I'm, I'm the Kubernetes user, Matt B, and have Tiller say, okay, well, let me see what your Kubernetes responsibilities and roles and permissions are, and then I will do this act on, on your behalf. So you won't be able to install it into Martin's staging uh, namespace because you don't have permissions there. You'll only be able to install it into your area. Um, we could not find a way to do this. We tried all kinds of things. Uh, we had one branch that lived on the Helm 2 uh, for, I think, six months, where we were trying to figure out, you know, ways to finagle around and embed stuff in gRPC headers that would authorize users for things. There was no way for a pod to contact the Kubernetes API on behalf of another user. It was always only itself. Uh, and we, we tried and tried. We tried probably near a dozen different ways, some of which were, you know, ridiculous at face value and others of which, you know, we worked and worked and worked and then ultimately decided they couldn't, uh, couldn't function the way we needed. So we ended up with a choice. We had two different models to make this work. Model one, we could take Tiller and we could write our own authentication and authorization system and uh, users could set up their own permissions and we could have a, a Helm Tiller administrator who managed the user and permissions database. And that administrator would also manage the permissions on the Kubernetes cluster and would have to manually you know, keep those in sync. Or we could remove Tiller altogether and use Kubernetes itself for the authentication authorization and have it all be negotiated between the client and, and the Kubernetes API server. So the first one obviously would have been very, very complicated, right? We would have introduced new roles, right? As you, you need a Tiller administrator. Uh, it would have introduced massive amounts of new code and it would have introduced the problem that we would have had to manually synchronize the permissions you had in Kubernetes with the permissions Tiller gave you. And we decided that was a non-starter. Uh, and so we began the process of tearing out Tiller. So in the new model, Helm 3 connects to the API server as Matt B or as Martin H. And when I connect to the Kubernetes server, the Kubernetes server says, okay, you only have access to your dev namespace. Martin has access to staging and dev, but you don't. So anytime you try and install something, it can only go into dev. And you can only install these particular things. So it used the Kubernetes RBAC system in Helm 3 directly by contacting and negotiating that directly with the Kubernetes API server instead of having Tiller as a, as a mid person that had to uh, receive everything and then act on behalf of someone else. So I'm acting on my own behalf instead of relying on Tiller. And that's how the new authentication and authorization model works. And it's proven to be, I think, the right step forward. I think we did the right thing in adjusting course. Uh, Kubernetes is indeed a multi-tenant environment. And in order to facilitate that, we needed to integrate as fully and completely with the Kubernetes way of doing things that we could. Now, unfortunately, the upshot of a lot of that, uh, any kind of pivot of that size, is that it's going to require some strain as we migrate from one to the other. And that's you know the, what we're here today to talk about, right? And nowhere did this issue show up more clearly than in the concept of a release. So releases have, tended, uh, have turned out to be the biggest impact on the Helm 2 to 3 migration. Uh, because we had to change the way this system worked in order to follow the, the, the new tiller structure. I think the introduction of releases, which came about in Helm 2, wasn't present in either Deployment Manager or Helm Classic. I think that was probably the single best design outcome of Helm. Uh, so what's a release? Well, a release is a record of an installation that's a living record that, uh, that updates each time uh, each time an installation is updated. So here, let me give you a practical example. So Martin and I are working on the same cluster and uh, we both want to install our, we're both working on separate projects, but we both, both want to use say Drupal to have our internal website for these things. So I want my Drupal instance, Martin wants his Drupal instance. Uh, so we should each be able to install separate versions of Drupal, his for his stuff, mine for my stuff. And then when I upgrade mine, it shouldn't impact his. And when he changes the values configuration on his, it shouldn't impact mine. So we need to track two separate installations of the same software. And then as I upgrade mine, we need to track how my version was upgraded and what changes happened between the last time and this time. That's how the release system in Helm works. That's the problem it's designed to solve, tracking those releases over or those installations over time. So I create a new release when I install it. I create a V2 release when I upgrade it the next time, then a V3 when I upgrade it after that. And I can roll back to V2 and things like that. 
Um, the way that it worked in Helm 2 was that uh, I would send, uh, for my Helm client, I would send the chart and the uh, and my values files up to Tiller, but Tiller would manage all the release stuff for me. The client could be basically blissfully unaware of how Tiller was managing all of the releases. Now, behind the scenes, Tiller was storing these things inside of the Kubernetes cluster uh, and was managing the versioning and checking for race conditions and doing all kinds of things like that. Uh, but when we did Helm 3, we had to figure out a way to go to this architecture where Helm was managing the releases from the client side without anything necessarily running inside of the server to manage the state for us. So that was a little bit tricky. And the number one problem we wanted to solve is the problem that we, we call the Friday release problem. And this is the one we needed to make sure that we nailed if we were going to make Helm 3 work. I'm sure, so this is, just to be clear, definitely not based on personal experience. I've definitely never had this happen to me. I'm sure all of you are saying the same thing. You have never had this particular incident uh, occur in your organization. But imagine, hypothetically, we had this case where, you know, your, your, your uh, colleague, uh, you know, Sam has is, is getting ready for a vacation. Now, Sam's got some major deadlines. Sam's got to get this thing out the door right away. Works and works and works and works on it. It's, you know, getting behind, but they think they can get it out just in time. It's 4.56 on a Friday. They got to leave work and make their way to the airport and catch their plane. They push that release out at 4.56. They take off and they're gone for a couple of weeks. So you're there, you know, wrapping up for the end of the day, looking forward to the weekend and that pizza party you're going to this evening when all of a sudden uh, the cluster, you know, catches fire. The release that Sam did uh, broke. And now you've got to fix it because Sam is gone and incommunicado for some amount of time. And so you're looking at everything going, well, what did Sam do? I need to figure out what it broke, how it broke, and how I can fix it. So with Helm Classic, there was no workflow at all for this scenario, right? Basically, you'd have to find Sam's workstation, log in and see what Sam did from Sam's point of view because there was no record whatsoever. In Helm 2, then, you know, you could contact Tiller and say, okay, show me what values were uploaded. Uh, show me what, what chart was used. You know, show me what the rendered version of the values was. Um, we needed to preserve that particular behavior but we needed to do it without Tiller, which meant our release record had to be robust enough that it could handle that particular scenario, but it had to be able to do it without introducing the race condition that happens when say, Martin and I are working on the same particular release. And we, we can't risk that if we accidentally both release very close to each other, we corrupt the Kubernetes installation or worse, we co corrupt the release record. So we have kind of the race condition thing going on at one side, uh, on one side while we were dealing with the Friday release problem on the other. And Helm 3 had to solve all of that while recognizing that there was no central authority, no tiller that was in the middle saying, okay, uh, hang on, Martin, Matt's release is going out. Okay, Matt's release is out, your turn, Martin, and stuff like that. Uh, so that necessitated making a number of changes to the release, uh, to the release object. But along with that, like I said, we buffered up a lot of changes, right? Um, we, we decided to make some other changes to the way releases worked so that we could correct a number of other things we did. So in Helm 2, releases were all stored together. So, uh, you know, Martin installs into his staging thing and I install into my dev, dev namespace, but both of our release records go in the same particular, the same place inside of Kubernetes. By default, we were putting them in kube system. A lot of people are like, why would you have done that? Well, again, let's rewind to the core assumption we made that turned out to be false. It was, we thought we were building a single tenant system. So it totally made sense to put stuff in kube system because kube system was where you put stuff you didn't want users to look at. And uh, we, we never thought about the fact that when you had a hundred different development teams all using the same thing, you could end up with tens of thousands of, of release records inside of kube system. Uh, so again, you know, it was a mistake made based on our faulty assumption. But uh, even, even though you can change where they're stored, when you change them, it still is the case that Tiller would store all the release records together, regardless of where, what namespace they were put into. Um, that introduced a number of management problems, particularly when we took Tiller out of the equation because Tiller was no longer, we didn't want to have to give everybody access to the same namespace so that they could store all of their releases in there and then assume that these development teams wouldn't accidentally stomp on each other's releases. So we needed to fix that. 
um, the, the, the Helm 2 era fix was to just tell everybody to run lots and lots of instances of Tiller, but that seemed like not a good solution in the long run. And so in Helm 3, we just changed it. So in Helm 3 now, the release records are stored side by side with the releases that they describe. So when I install WordPress into my dev namespace, the release records, instead of being written to Kube system or somewhere else, the release records are also written into the same namespace. They're also written into the dev namespace. And when Martin installs his version into his staging environment, his release records get written into the staging namespace. Now this has turned out to actually have some great uh, benefits to it. First of all, um, you know, you can use RBACs and things like that to limit access. So we didn't worry about necessarily polluting that, that namespace with things that, uh, that users could uh, change around when they shouldn't. Uh, but, but moreover, uh, say you, say you, uh, you know, you get, uh, you get that Friday situation, right? And, um, and you have to drop into a namespace you're unfamiliar with and you do, you know, kubectl get pods and you see a bazillion things running and you do kubectl get secrets and you see another bunch of things running and you're going, what are all these things and how do they tie together? Well, now you can just point Helm 3 at that namespace and say, tell me all the things that were released into this namespace, you know, Helm LS, this namespace. And it'll say, okay, well, you know, here's, here's a Drupal instance and here's a chart museum instance and here's, you know, three HA proxy instances. That's what you're seeing in this cluster. So it really localized the management of your releases into just one namespace, which again, really fits the multi-tenant model that we've seen Kubernetes mature into. Uh, so it's been great. We really like that. Um, the, the really kind of the only caveat we had to give people in this case was just don't create multi-tenant namespaces. You don't want all of your teams working on the default namespace. You want to sort of segment things out. And then the, the built-in security features of Kubernetes and the RBAC system will help you protect each namespace and grant people access to just the releases, the Helm releases that they're supposed to be able to see. So we're actually really excited about that particular change in Helm 3 because it really opened up a, a security model that better fit with the way Kubernetes uh, now works, right? The way Kubernetes had matured its security model. Um, then we made one more change uh, to releases that's a notable change. Um, when we wrote Helm 2, we stored our releases inside of config maps. Why did we do that? Well, there were really two reasons to store them in config maps at that point. Um, reason number one was that config maps uh, were just ever so slightly smaller than secrets. We had one less base 64 pass over them, ever so slightly smaller. Um, not, not actually a very good reason, but the second reason is even worse. Uh, we used config maps because config maps were new and shiny. And we were like, hey, new and shiny, this must be the way forward. Secrets are old, they're gonna go away. We're gonna use config maps. Well, we were really kind of wrong on that count too. Um, and, and, you know, the, the excuse at the time was, well, a secret's not really secret at all. It's just a base 64 encoded object. But since then, again, things have changed. Uh, the security model for Kubernetes has matured and the usage patterns for, for Helm and for Kubernetes have changed. And now we're in this situation where it's more important to protect the information in that release uh, than it is to save on size or anything else. Um, and, and so they really ought to go in secrets. And furthermore, secrets in Kubernetes now can be backed by vaults and other storage systems that actually store encrypted secrets. So there is actually a legitimate safety and security story behind storing them in secrets. Okay, so now if we add all those things up, right? We've made several big changes to releases. We've changed where they're stored. We've changed some of the formatting of how the, uh, how the record looks. Uh, we've changed where the kind of object they're stored inside of in Kubernetes. Those are all big deals. And those are all things that when we move from Helm 2 to Helm 3, they have to be renegotiated, right? We have to actually migrate that data from an old format in an old location to a new format in a new location. That's why secrets have been really kind of the focus of, the, of, of my discussion so far. I mean, sorry, secrets, uh, releases. Why releases have really been a focal point is because this is the number one thing that, uh, that we have to deal with and deal with very carefully when we're doing migrations like later on in the workshop. I did wanna cover one more thing um, as, we, as we talk about the differences between Helm 2 and 3, uh, but this one will have less of an impact than you might suppose on the migrations that we're gonna do today and on your real world migrations. When we introduced Helm 3, we also changed the, the structure of the chart. 
It was really our biggest change ever to the chart format. Um, so again, another embarrassing story. Um, I've been working on a book with Matt Farina and with Josh Delitsky about Helm 3. Uh, it'll be out, I think, probably December or something. So we're done writing everything. So if you ever uh, worked on, on the book writing process, you write all the chapters and then you send them to the publisher and the publisher gets some volunteers from the community uh, and, and from the technical, uh, technical arenas to read the book and give you early uh, give you an early critique of what was clear, what was unclear, uh, what wasn't covered, what was over covered, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I was shocked when I got back a technical review that was just like uh, angry. We'll just say angry. Uh, and the reviewer is going, hey, I don't understand this. I thought you were going to write a book about Helm 3. And instead, you're writing a book about Helm 2. And over and over again, you're talking about Helm 2 and you're talking about you know, uh, how this should work. And I don't even understand why you're bothering to cover any of this because by the time the book comes out, Helm 2 will be fully deprecated. And I'm going, I only wrote one paragraph about Helm 2 and it was basically migrate off of Helm 2 by November 13th or else. Then I realized to my horror that I had been talking about charts, charts V2, and the reader had thought that charts V2 were part of Helm V2 and we had, I, this is the first time it actually occurred to me, oh no, uh, Charts V1 worked with Helm V2. Charts V2 work with Helm V3. Charts V2 don't work with Helm V2, but Charts V2 and Charts V1 both work with Helm V3. We created a naming nightmare. And I very much apologize for not noticing this until just recently. Um, but the upshot of this uh, is that it's going to be confusing, but uh, we, we introduced a new version of charts called Chart V2 that is part of Helm 3. Uh, and these charts have a couple of, of structural differences. Uh, we changed the version string from version 1 to version 2. That's always a good thing. But we also, we moved from the requirements YAML content directly into the charts.yaml file. So there is no more requirements.yaml. We added a CRDs directory. We added the ability to write JSON schemas that can be used to schematize a values.yaml file. Um, uh, Martin wrote uh, the support for a library chart. A library chart is a, uh, a chart that doesn't actually install anything on its own, but can be used by other charts for it to provide common tooling. It was a pattern that we saw emerge out of the, uh, out of the community building of charts but which we thought we could sort of like further uh, canonize and then make it easier to support as a first class thing. So these were some of the changes we made in charts V2 for Helm V3. I'm gonna trip myself up here any moment now. Um, it's good to take a look at these things. Uh, you may have inadvertently run across this when you tried to install a V2 chart with V2 Helm because those are incompatible. Um, but the, the best part uh, for this particular context is that you don't have to actually uh, worry about the V2 versions of charts in order to do this migration. Helm 3 shipped with full support for the older chart format. And so as we do this migration, we actually don't have to change anything about the charts. The focus is really more on the releases. Now, as you have time and needs that are better handled by the new version of charts, you know, I'd urge you to migrate um, because the new version does have some niceties and some, uh, some forward-looking features that will make certain other things easier. Uh, but there's no rush to take care of that particular thing during your uh, migration. So uh, I think I would like to give a chance for people to ask questions if we feel like we have enough time for that. Otherwise, we can go straight into Martin's. I'll let Bridget kind of call the shots here. Oh, hey, we had a few questions in the chat, but um, I think we are mostly up to date. Uh, perhaps just telling folks if they are getting started taking a look at the Helm 3 book, can they start there? What can they start with? If they were taking a look at the Helm 3 what? The Helm 3 book that you wrote, Learning Helm. Can they start uh. there? <laughs> Yeah, so it'll come out from O'Reilly in uh, in December of this year, um, and I, I don't actually know what the publication date is. Uh, in the meantime, uh, docs the docs site for Helm, you know, covers really a lot of the the same material. The book will be sort of more obviously bigger narrative form with a lot of explanation of how it works, um, and and more more stories about 
<laughs> mistakes we made in Helm 2 and how we fixed them and other things like that. Um, but definitely for now, the best best source is the Helm.sh docs. And then coming in December, you know, makes makes a lovely holiday gift. Uh, that's probably not true. <laughs> um, but uh, that's when that'll come out. Did that answer the question? I think so. We had one other question in Helm 3, the version of the charts is V2? Question yes. mark? <laughs> This is this is the thing. This is I'm so sorry about this. In hindsight, we should have just skipped V2 of the charts. So charts really only had one version um, up until Helm 3 came out. You know, we we the compatibility level for charts has, has been very high from Helm 2 Alpha 1 up to the present. Um, but when we wanted to change some things in the format of the chart, we incremented the version number exactly one which brought us to Charts V2. So Charts V2 are for Helm V3, and Charts V2 do not work in Helm V2. So again, it was a naming faux pas on our side, um, and we'll try and, I guess, I guess with Helm 4, we'll have another shot at it. So we'll try and do Charts V4. We'll write a throwaway version of Charts V3 so that we can iterate the version number and, uh, and have them move in lockstep. Just one of those things you learn in hindsight that's hard. All right, any other okay. questions? Okay, we had one other asked, um, is there a way to watch or observe a release outside of Helm, in particular to be notified, say, in a controller when an upgrade or installation is happening? So that is an interesting question, and I like it because um, it is possible, and I don't know of anybody who's tried this before. So here's what you could do. Um, you could write a controller that would observe the release records as they're written to Kubernetes. So you basically write a controller that watches for secrets with the Helm uh, type attached to them. And uh, the, the release record actually gives a fair amount of information about the current state uh, that, that the release is in. Uh, and many of these things are, you don't necessarily see surfaced all the way to the client because they're so quick that the client wouldn't necessarily see them. But you'll see it go into its pre-install and then its install and then uh, it's installed status or it's upgrading status and then it's upgraded status. Uh, so you could actually write a controller that would do it. It'd be a really cool controller. If anybody wants to give it a shot, I think it would be uh, really interesting because you could write some monitoring uh, tooling that would say, hey, it looks like seven people are upgrading their Helm charts right now. And you know this one is taking a really long time, but the other four seem to be on, or other, other four, I can count, other six seem to be on track. Uh, so yeah, that's a great question. Great. So summarizing, um, if you're migrating a chart, not a deployment, just the chart, are only a couple of changes needed, like move the requirements.yaml inside the chart.yaml, bump the API version, anything else? And Martin um, is answering in the chat saying you don't need to convert the chart to API version 2, only if you want to use, use new capability. Do you want to kind of clarify on that topic? Yeah. Do you want do you want to take a minute or will I answer that one? Go ahead. Yeah. So, a, um, and I'm going to touch touch on it in a few minutes. But um, your API version v1 charts, which were used in Helm v2 and v1, um, are still rendered renderable in Helm v3 without any changes, except around um, CRD install hooks. So. What will happen in that situation is it doesn't install the CRDs if you're using CRD install hooks. Um, and also, it won't create a namespace on the fly unless you give it an extra flag. But apart from that, they're still renderable because we wanted to maintain that capability. Uh, but if you want to use new capability, like um, you want to use the type, whether you want to specify it's an application or library charts, or you want to use the new way to... Um, to use dependencies, for example, in the chart.yaml, then you'd, you'd bump it up to API version v2 and you'd make the changes there. And I suppose going down the line, it'd be uh, before we get to Helm 4, if Helm 4 um, comes out someday, then you probably would want to have moved up to API version v2. Uh, does that seem okay, Matt? Yep. Yeah, thank you, Martin. And I think we have time for one last question, which is, uh, so Helm 3 doesn't use its own dedicated CRDs, just secret resources? Yes. Question mark? Yes. Um, uh, we, we explored the CRD route 
very carefully. Um, there were a couple of security things that caused us to go against uh, the that ca that weighed against it, but ultimately, at the end of the day, there is one feature of feature of CRDs that we've realized could be so utterly catastrophic that we would not do it. Um, CRDs, by definition, are are modifiable by uh, cluster users, right? Whereas secrets are not. If for any reason you delete a CRD, it deletes all the resources of that type, which means with one accidental typo, you could wipe out all the Helm releases on your cluster. And <laughs> we went, that's not any problem we ever want to force anybody into. Uh, secrets actually have been perfectly capable of, of accomplishing what we've needed. Uh, and so there wasn't necessarily a big, uh, big requirement that we move off of secrets. Uh, the, the security consideration for secrets was because secrets are auto backed by a vault on some systems and the different customers can choose easily which particular security backend they want. Uh, secrets ended up being a, have, having some highly desirable features that would make the security model quite a bit stronger. But at the end of the day, it was that uh, scary scenario in which you could wipe out all your releases that ultimately I think convinced us that was wrong. So that's why we chose secrets and why we didn't choose CRDs. 